On a wind-scoured ridge in the high desert, a storm is closing in. The light goes flat. The air tastes like dust and electricity. A band of wild mustangs stands frozen against the sky. Ears pricked, nostrils flared, every muscle tight. Far below, a helicopter rises over the horizon. The rotors beat the air into a low, relentless roar. The herd bunches together, instinct pulling them into a tight knot of muscle and fear. They are about to run for their lives. But the real battle they are trapped in is not just on this ridge. It's on paper, in courtrooms, in scientific journals. On one side, they are called invasive, feral livestock, trespassers. On the other, they are called native, a returning piece of a lost ecosystem. As the helicopter closes in, one question hangs over the dust and the thunder of hooves. Are these horses outsiders or are they finally coming home? For years, the story sounded simple. Horses evolved somewhere else. Spanish conquistadors brought them over in the 1500s. Some escaped, some were stolen. They went wild. They became Mustangs. End of story. But then scientists started opening old bones and the story began to crack. In a quiet lab thousands of miles from that desert ridge, a paleontologist lifts a fragile skull from a padded box. Not plastic, not a replica, a real horse, turned to stone and dust over thousands, even millions of years. Under the microscope, the details are unmistakable. This is not a foreign visitor. This is a horse that lived and died in North America, long before any conquistador ever set foot on this continent. Then, in another lab, a geneticist feeds a tiny fragment of powdered bone into a machine the size of a washing machine. Inside, ancient DNA, shattered, fragile, almost gone, begins to reveal its code. The results are unsettling. Horses did not just arrive in North America with Europeans. They began here, they evolved here, they vanished here, and then, somehow, they came back. So the question that haunts every roundup, every policy meeting, every argument on social media becomes, if horses are born of this land, can they ever truly be non-native to it? And if the answer is no, what does that do to everything we thought we knew about wild Mustangs? To understand today's Mustangs, we have to step out of the corral, out of human memory, out of written history, we go back more than a million years. The landscape is colder, wilder. Saber-toothed cats stalk the edges of frozen valleys. Mammoths move like shadows through blowing snow. And in the middle of this dangerous, unbroken world are horses. Not the polished show horses we know today. Shorter, stockier, some with three toes, some already walking on a single, strong hoof. They graze ancient grasslands from Alaska to Mexico. They cross and recross the Bering Land Bridge into Asia. Generations pass. Bones sink into mud. Species change, then vanish. For millions of years, North America is not just a place where horses happen to live. It is their cradle, their testing ground, their evolutionary home. Then, near the end of the Ice Age, something happens. Climate shifts, grasslands change, human hunters spread across the continent, bison survive, pronghorns survive, horses do not. One species after another disappears, hoof prints vanish from riverbanks, the last wild whinny fades into the wind. For thousands of years, North America is a continent without horses. Only their fossils remain buried in silence. But half a world away, some of their cousins survive. In Asia, in Europe, living, breeding, changing. Humans find them, capture them, learn to ride their backs, harness their strength, follow their speed into war and empire. Horses become soldiers, partners, tools. They pull plows, charge into battle, carry messengers through the night. And then 
Centuries later, humans bring them back across the ocean to the very continent that once gave birth to them. The 1500s, Spanish ships cut through rough Atlantic water. In the darkness below deck, horses sway against their ropes. They stamp, they sweat, they survive the crossing, or they don't. When they finally step onto the shores of the Americas, everything changes. Mounted on horseback, conquistadors move faster, hit harder, see farther. To indigenous people who have not lived with horses for thousands of years, these riders look almost otherworldly. But the horses themselves behave like what they are, prey animals in a new world full of old dangers. Some break loose in storms, some slip away during battles, some are stolen, traded, gifted, bred. They move inland like water soaking into dry ground. Indigenous nations across the Great Plains, the Comanche, Lakota, Cheyenne, Nez Perce, and many others, do not just receive horses, they transform them. They become expert breeders, trainers, riders. Horses carry hunters after buffalo herds with unheard of speed. They carry families, goods, stories, and culture across distances that once took weeks on foot. Horses become woven into ceremony, art, identity, and survival. But in the history books written later, much of this is erased. We are told a neat, simple tale. Horses disappeared. Europeans brought them back. They escaped. They went feral. They become Mustangs, from the Spanish Mesteño, meaning ownerless, stray. Even their names suggest they belong to no one, to no past, to no story deeper than a few runaway Spanish horses. That version is easier, cleaner, but beneath the surface of that story, something doesn't quite fit. Ancient fossils say horses started here. Oral histories and archeological evidence hint that native peoples may have been working with horses earlier and differently than the textbooks admit. And now, the DNA is beginning to speak. Back to the lab. The ancient skull lies under bright white lights. A drill whines softly as it bites into dense bone just beneath the eye socket. Fine, chalk-like dust falls into a sterile tube. Millions of years collapsed into a pinch of powder. From that dust, scientists pull out molecules of DNA, broken and fragile, but still holding their code. They upload the sequence, they wait. On a computer screen, colored lines begin to form, bars, peaks, patterns. The geneticist leans closer. The sequence is compared to DNA from modern horses, race horses, draft horses, backyard ponies, and wild mustangs. What they find is not a perfect match. Too much time has passed, too many branches on the family tree. But there is something else, something subtle, something powerful. Ancient North American horses are not strangers to modern mustangs. They are family. They share deep lineages, connections that reach back before humans kept stud books, before breeds had names. It is as if the continent is remembering an old bloodline. At the same time, archaeologists begin to find horse remains in surprising places. Teeth with wear patterns that look like bits in riding gear long before European saddles appear in the records. Horse bones buried at indigenous village sites, far from any Spanish mission, in layers of earth older than we expected. And alongside the bones, stories. Elders from some native communities describe horses not as a new arrival, but as a return, a reunion. Meanwhile, ecologists and land managers are using another language. They have to put animals into boxes, native, non-native, invasive, reintroduced. Each word carries legal weight. Each label decides who is protected and who is not. To them, Mustangs are classified as feral, domestic livestock gone wild, competing with cattle, chewing up grasslands, damaging fragile desert springs. Only truly native wildlife, elk, pronghorn, bighorn sheep, 
are granted full protection on these lands. So when the DNA begins to hint at a different story, the ground under this classification starts to shift. If a species begins in a place, disappears, and is then brought back centuries later, what is it? Native? Reintroduced? Invasive? Something in between. There is no fossil that can answer that. No single DNA strand that can tell us what a law should say. But the lines on the computer screen are clear about one thing. Horses are not foreigners to North America. They are part of its deep evolutionary memory. A conference room, rows of chairs, a projector hums in the dim light. On the screen, graphs, timelines, ancient skulls, modern herds. At the front, a scientist, hands shaking just slightly as they grip the laser pointer. In the audience, land managers, ranchers, conservationists, tribal representatives, wild horse advocates. Many of them have spent their lives in this debate. Some see Mustangs as icons of freedom. Others see them as competition for grass their cattle depend on. All of them are about to hear something that might redraw the lines. The scientist clicks to the final slide. Two curves glow on the screen. One shows the genetic story of ancient North American horses. The other shows modern horses from Spanish bloodlines, from draft breeds, from wild Mustangs that still roam the West. There is a long, empty gap where extinction hit. But on both sides of that gap, the curves rise from the same root. The key point, the scientist says quietly, is that modern horses, including Mustangs, and the horses that evolved here share a common North American ancestry. A murmur moves through the room. It does not mean Mustangs are the exact same species that vanished at the end of the Ice Age. It does not erase the role of Spanish, indigenous, and later American people in spreading and shaping them. But it does something powerful. It breaks the myth that horses are purely foreign invaders on this land. The scientist goes on. If we define native only by whether a species was here continuously since the Ice Age, they say, then yes, we might call them non-native. But if we define native by where a lineage evolved, where its deepest roots lie, then horses are as North American as bison. Silence follows. Because if that's true, everything from management plans to moral arguments begins to shift. Back out on the range, a stallion stands between his band and the horizon. His mane is whipped by the same wind that once combed the coats of ancient horses. He tosses his head, he snorts. Does he know that in a room far away his status, invader or returning native, is being decided in the glow of a PowerPoint slide? Of course not. He only knows the land under his hooves, the water holes he remembers, the routes he teaches his foals as they follow at his side. But our decision about who he is will decide whether helicopters come for him or whether the land itself makes room for his story. The DNA is published, the papers spread, headlines appear. Are Mustangs really native? Ancient DNA challenges old assumptions. Some ecologists begin to argue for a new category, reintroduced native, a species that started here, vanished, and came back with human help. Indigenous voices push for something deeper, a recognition that horses are part of their cultural and spiritual landscape, not just biological units to be tallied and removed. But laws and policies move more slowly than science. On the ground, roundups continue. Helicopters still chase Mustangs across open country, funneling them into traps. Hooves skid on dust. Foals lose sight of their mothers in a blur of bodies in fear. In official documents, many of these same horses are still listed as feral and non-native. Their numbers are cut to make room for cattle. Their value measured in grazing statistics, not in stories, not in memory. And yet, something has changed. In living rooms, classrooms, and online communities, the question is no longer hidden in specialist journals. People are asking, 
If horses evolved here, if their ancient bones sleep in our deserts and riverbeds, do we have a responsibility to see them as more than pests? On a winter evening, a young mare stands alone, a dark shape against pale snow. She was born in a holding facility after her dam was rounded up. She has never felt wild rain on her back, never followed a band across the open sage. To the system that controls her life, she is a number, a cost, an animal whose ancestors took the wrong path through history. But to a child standing at the fence, watching her with wide eyes, she is something else entirely. A mystery, a survivor, a living link to a world where horses once thundered across this land in numbers we can hardly imagine. So we are left with a choice. We can keep calling Mustangs invaders, ignoring the fossils beneath our boots and the DNA tracing their story back into the deep past. Or we can accept the unsettling truth that sometimes a species can be both shaped by humans and still belong to a place, both reintroduced and deeply, undeniably from here. The storm over the high desert finally breaks. Rain hisses against rock and sage. A wild band of horses turns their tails to the wind, bodies pressed close, eyes half closed against the sting. They do not know our definitions. They only know hunger, thirst, danger, shelter, and the memory of where to run when the sky goes dark. So we end where we began, with one question hanging in the air between hoofbeats and helicopter blades, between ancient DNA and modern politics. When a species comes home after thousands of years away, do we meet it as an enemy? Or do we welcome it back as something we nearly lost and are only now beginning to understand? Or is this only the beginning of the story we will tell about them? Quick recap. Horses evolved in North America, spreading across the world before vanishing from this continent at the end of the Ice Age. Centuries later, humans brought their descendants back and Mustangs rose from escaped and traded horses. Ancient fossils and modern DNA now reveal a deep shared ancestry between those ancient North American horses and the horses we see today. That evidence doesn't erase history, but it does challenge the idea that Mustangs are purely foreign invaders. How we answer the question, native or not, will shape everything about how we treat wild Mustangs from this moment on. If this story shifted the way you see wild Mustangs, even a little, let me know in the comments. Do you think Mustangs are invaders or returning natives? Share this video with someone who loves horses. Hit like so more people hear this story and subscribe for the next chapter in this wild, complicated relationship between horses, humans, and the land they're both trying to call home.